Thanks, Chrissy. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as we discuss findings from a recent enterprise strategy group study that showed that tape continues to provide considerable cost advantages over disk. I'm Kimberly Sturdivant from Fleischman Hillard, the media rep for the LTO program. Our speakers today will be Mark Peters, senior analyst with ESG who conducted the study. Mark has more than 20 years' experience in IT and at ESG focuses on storage systems as well as the challenges of power, cooling, and space efficiency in data centers. Our other guest speaker today is Richard Dick Cosby, system administrator for Estes Express Lines, a company which offers a full spectrum of shipping and supply chain management services. Estes is an LTO tape user that has weathered the storm, literally, when the company was hit hard by an unforeseen natural disaster. We will hear from Dick on how LTO tape helped Estes recover from a natural disaster and how his company uses tape to help control costs and protect data. With that, I will let Mark Peters take over. Mark? Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you to all our friends in the LTO program, and, and most of all to those of you who are joining us, wherever you happen to be. I want to take you first and, and have a look at our agenda. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and ESG, fairly obvious stuff to get going, because I can't assume that many of you know uh, ESG, or any of you know me, so I'll take you through that. Then there will be some sort of headlines from the study that uh, was completed. I then want to turn, before I get into the nitty gritty of the, the findings, which you can see are the fourth billet on the screen, I then want to take you through some thoughts about the industry and where tape fits into that these days. I think that's very relevant, otherwise the results are purely just results. And whilst any numbers are interesting and comparative numbers are clearly more interesting, they're still only relevant if they have a bearing on what you're all trying to do for a living which is, you know, invariably to meet user demands and to be more efficient and effective in the way that you do those. So uh, I want to talk a little bit more broadly about tape in the market. That's the third bullet there. After I take you through a more detailed look at the TCO findings themselves, the study that uh, we completed, there'll be a very pleasant break from listening to me, and you can listen to a slightly different accent when Dick Cosby, Vestas Express, takes over for about 10 minutes. And I have some closing thoughts before... Uh, although it's not on the screen here, we should have some time for Q&A at the end. So very quickly, before I talk about ESG, let me sort of tell you a story about how I got into the business. Back in the mid-1980s, there was a very scared young man, me, in a very dull hotel room somewhere near Heathrow in, in the UK with some very stern-looking engineering-type people trying to explain to me the difference between, I think, if I get my numbers right, a 3288 and a 3420 Model 8. I know I've got the last one right. Uh, this will really test anyone on the call who is middle-aged, shall we say, nicely. 50 is the new 40, so you're all okay. But the only challenge was I didn't even know what a 3420 Model 8 was. I didn't even know what tape did at the time. So trying to tell me the difference between the IBM model, which is, for those of you who don't know, the 3420 Model 8, and what the little Fujitsu 3288 was, was kind of lost on me. But I tell you that story to say that Unlike many people who work in the analyst business, I've actually spent a long time on the tape side of the business. I worked for Memorex Telex for a couple of years and then for Storage Tech for the best part of two decades. I actually left them shortly after Sun, just so you know, had my own business for a time, did the startup thing for a time, and then joined ESG as an analyst about four years ago. So just a little bit of background so you know who's doing the talking at you. And then I now would like to just very briefly, I'm not going to turn this into a big commercial, but to take you through what ESG is, just so you know. We're based in Massachusetts. I'm actually talking to you from sunny Colorado, but uh, about 60 of us, a little over that, uh, consultants and analysts. And obviously with anyone who puts the name or the, the moniker analyst, we have opinions. And opinions matter, but the point of putting this slide up as much as anything is facts matter too. And so there are two ways that will hopefully become clear to you today. Firstly, in terms of the project and the details you're going to see and the work that went into that. And just as important, I think, as some of the research items, you can see that in the top right. We do a lot of end user research, not so much around market numbers, more around intentions and what's going on from a buying perspective. And so we do like to use research wherever possible. And you'll see some of both of that as I take you through things today. I'm going to take you through the overview of the uh, TCO model and the findings that we did. So that, that, first of all, at the highest level, the study itself was to compare the TCO, total cost of ownership, obviously, of VTLs and physical tape. V 
physical tape, obviously being LTO5, that being the, the main one that we talked about. And we looked, as you can see in the sub-bullets there, at various approaches in terms of backup and disaster recovery, and I'll take you through precisely what those were later. We focused on the disk side, the VTL side, on the impact of deduplication as well as the actual capabilities of the device itself. And obviously, as I already mentioned, you would know this since you dialed in for the call on LTO5 when it was on the tape side. We have, and again, I'll give you some samples later. You can get the full details in the report. As it says there, the, the white paper is available, and I'll give you the link later on. But we tried to cover, we really did spend a lot of time trying to get as full a range of economic inputs as we possibly could. And you'll see some of those later. As I say, everything is available in the white paper. Everything is open, and that's one of the things I'll, I'll probably stress a couple of times as we go through this. And the bottom line, you can read, but the bottom line is that LTO5 in tape libraries has a lower TCO than deduplicated disk. Clearly, the use of tape is excellent for long-term data protection and storage. I think that's very obvious. And the disk options, and I'll express all these pricing and economic outcomes in different ways later because some people like to look at things in, in different ways, whether it's percentage higher or, you know, X factor or whatever. But disk options ranged from, as you can see, just under two to just over four times more costly than the tape options. And pretty much across the board, tape exhibited a lower cost per gigabyte of storage, probably no surprise, in terms of operational expense and also energy consumption. Now, I say they're probably no surprise, but although this is not an interactive call at the moment, it would be interesting to know whether it does in fact surprise some of you because certainly over the last couple of years, deduplication VTLs have done very well in terms of getting mind share. But one thing that I'd like to point out even before we get into some of the more detail is, is the underlying issue that dedupe is trying to affect was never really, in my view, dollars or getting rid of tape or being a better way to do backup. In my view, dedupe, as implemented on the back end, which is what it has been mainly so far in the industry, was entirely about time and time constraints. I'm not saying the other things of money, tape, and backup weren't important, but it was all about time. And that's why many people now, we'll get into how, exactly how many and how they do it later, but that's why many users now do their initial backup to disk. It's purely about time. So somehow that has... I don't know, transmogrified, whatever, you know, changed in the, in the view of the industry to be that dedupe is just the way that you now, you know, dedupe disk is now just the way you do backup because it's cheaper and it's better than tape and so on. And none of that is actually true. It was a trying to affect time. And that's something that we'll come back to later in this discussion. So in terms of that little discussion about dedupe, none of that obviates the value of tape. As I said early on, I want to turn now to look more broadly at what's going in the market. I just mentioned not obviating tape's value. So, you know, what is that value in terms of what's going on in the world today? Starting at the very highest level, the pro and con of pro and pro of tape. What I really mean by this is that tape was a big deal, certainly back in the 80s, 90s, when I entered the market. And one can argue to what extent it has remained a big deal. It's always been there, but it certainly hasn't been talked about lately. I, I mentioned that I came into the business as an analyst about four years ago, and I, I, it was almost quite strange. It was kind of, who wants to look after tape? Because no one else really wanted to, and so because I'd been in that business before, I, I was quite happy to. I've always felt some sort of um, brotherhood with people who were in the tape business. But what's really interesting, and this is why it says, and pro of tape at the end, is that having been frankly, barely involved in any briefings or talking about tape for the first couple of years at least that uh, I was in this job, it really has picked up in the last year or 18 months. There's a lot more activity, and to me, it feels as if it's on, definitely on and up. Now, second bullet, changing uses for tape, those are pretty obvious. It's gone from backup to archive and DR, although even there, I want to What's, what's the word here? I, I, want, I, I just said from backup to archive and DR, and that's not a fair use of the English language. It's not gone from one thing to the other. It's just that it still does backup, still used for backup by many people, and we'll see the numbers in a minute. But we've added more focus on archiving and DR. And now with some of the new access tools like LTFS, we're also adding more ability to use the, the archive and tape more actively. So 
you know, certainly the use has changed, but it hasn't gone from one thing to another. It's just that it's changed in terms of the percentage way that it is used, and we've added new uses to it. The rest of the slide, as you can see, is a very definite attempt by me to talk about economics. There are two key things when it comes to storage. There's volume and there's cost. And I would argue that of the two, cost is most important. At the end of the day, all storage is about economics. When we say it's about capacity or we say it's about performance as the lead factor, I think we do ourselves a disservice. The reason for this is if you imagine at the margin that storage was free, then you, know, you wouldn't worry with a lot of the storage hierarchy issues that you currently worry with. Everything would be up in main memory somewhere, and I agree, for the sake of this discussion, you would still need to have some way of backing it up and copies, so let's just put that to one side. But you would certainly, if storage were free, certainly put all your active storage and, and take copies, and you'd do it all up in memory, if you possibly could. You can't because it costs too much. It's not that we want to have different forms of performance and capacity. It's that we're constrained to do so by the economics. So this point I'm trying to get across, the massive focus on economics, there should be no embarrassment in talking about it. Anyone who's ever been on a sales course knows, oh, you're not supposed to talk about the price. You just establish the value, and miraculously the price comes out at the end and someone will, will pay for it. There is nothing wrong with talking about economics. It is absolutely crucial when it comes to storage in general, and therefore it's absolutely crucial when it comes to talking about tape. In this next slide, with a little more graphical interest, I want to cover, if you like, the summary of where we are with tape at the moment. Guess what? Tape isn't dead, as it said, and in fact, a far more positive way, if you look at the bumper sticker there, hopefully it's the one that stands out, tape is alive and well. And that's not just my opinion, that's based on the facts, that's based on the growth of the market, that's based on talking to people both within the LTO program and in the tape market more broadly. Tape is doing surprisingly well right now. This point here I have on the left about perception isn't reality. Again, that links back to some of what I was saying about DJUP and why we did this study in the first place. And just interestingly, I wish I could share some of the names on this. I can't, unfortunately. But I've spoken to end users who, you know, done the, the rushing off to disk attempt. And I've talked to some very big end users, both sides of the Atlantic, that have since come back to tape because they've realized what they were missing. So, as I say, perception isn't reality right now. The use cases we've mentioned, I'll say it more clearly here, are Archive and Armageddon, long-term bulk storage and, and, and DR. And clearly, although this isn't talked about a lot in the, uh, the TCO, other than in terms of not needing to replace cartridges for the life of the model, but the life, the media life of tape is very important when it comes to those two cases. The bullet at the bottom in terms of tape being well-suited for what's next may surprise some people because, you know, is it really possible that tape is, you know, almost, I don't know if trendy is the right word, sexy is one that people throw around, and I perhaps shouldn't use any of those words. But certainly, I think if we look at where the world is going, storage world, I mean, I think that tape could be more relevant than it has been for a few years. Now, what do I really mean by that? So, turbulence equals opportunity. Whenever change is happening, whenever people are making change, whether it's private life, business life, their storage world, that leads to opportunity. When people start thinking about, you know, when something makes them consider, you know, am I really doing this the right way? Should I do it somehow differently? Then they're probably going to think about that across all their life and not just in one area. So, by the way, before you, you know, there's a great little quote I was reminded of when I was putting this together, and I'm probably misquoting because I didn't have time to go and check it, but Oscar Wilde once said something like, an idea that's not a little dangerous is unworthy of being called an idea at all. I think me propounding that tape is on the upswing, I am honestly not just saying because of the, the nature of this webinar. It's something I genuinely believe because of some of the other things that are on this sheet. So whilst it is Fully clear, if you look at the sub-bullets to the first point, that direct backup to tape only uh, is certainly waning. Many people use a disk option. We'll see how many in just a second. But it is also far from disappeared from the market. So that's sort of the old stuff. Why on earth in a webinar about tape am I about to talk to you about solid state for a second? Solid state's very interesting. It's been around for many years. In fact, that young kid that I talked about who was me selling for Memorex in the 80s, you know, shortly after that, at the end of the 80s, there was solid state that was available in the market. DRAM-based cost about, I think, 8,000 bucks a, a megabyte or something, just to make everyone go, wow, I remember the old days. But um, the reason I'm talking about solid state, it is notable because it's not just happening in the storage environment. It's also happening as storage, as cache, in many implementations in servers. 
And it is just a matter of the economics of IOPS and getting the IOPS price down. Right now, you can make a case for solid state used at the margin, and that's gradually, that margin is moving into the mainstream gradually. But although a lot of what solid state is dressed up as performance, in my view, it's not. It's what that performance allows you to do in terms of economics that's important. And so people are gradually going to be going, hey, I can do, pick a number, 100,000 IOPS more cheaply on what looks like expensive solid state than I can actually do on inefficiently used disk. And so gradually solid state is going to come more into the equation. I think if we talk about the way that will make people think about tiering, about where they place things, I'm talking about the sort of promise or the, the phoenix of ILM now, which you can see on the sheet in front of you, on the screen in front of you, I think that's going to make people think more broadly about where they actually place data. And if we can add to this, so let's have, you know, think of a world where a lot of IO, active IO, is actually served from solid state. If you no longer need as much disk, certainly not as much as fast disk, and we can talk as we get to the model again about whether that's uh, on a deduped VTL or on tape, but if you could put it on tape and be able to accurately, easily locate and retrieve it, which again is some of these file systems like LTFS that are coming out, now you have a very interesting model for the future. And uh, if you weren't already bored by my use of the word economics three times, four times on, I think, the last slide, but one, economics is absolutely crucial in the storage business right now. I made the point before, but now I actually want to use some research to back that up. This is not just assertion. Every year we go out and we talk to hundreds of end users, different sizes from mid-range up to full enterprise about what's most important to them. And here you can see that for the last three years, and I think the, the drop, if you look right at the top here, cost reduction initiatives, this, this is the business initiatives, you can see from the question, that will impact IT spending decisions. Cost reduction is the number one item. Now, whilst the amount by which it leads everything else has somewhat shrunk over the last couple of years, and I think that's as the recession has at least eased, and we don't need to get into the politics of whether it's gone, returning, whatever, but it has certainly eased over the last two or three years. But you'll see that nothing else has jumped up quite so significantly to take the number two or three spot. In fact, those, those other things have themselves just moved around a little bit. So it is still clear that cost is number one, and that's why I don't mind. Um, I would bang on my desk if it wouldn't annoy all your eardrums, but it's still very crucial. Now, there's a further subtlety to this. Within this, when we've drilled down into the research, reducing OPEX for the last two or three years has been more important than reducing CAPEX. And that's a big change if we look back over the, the many years that we've done this research. So getting OPEX down is very, very crucial. And you can imagine all of those, I'm guessing many of you on the phone actually use tape, others who are considering it. The best use of power is no power, and, and tape just sitting there doesn't really use any power. So for example, from the OPEX point of view, tape can be exceedingly attractive. Now, moving away from cost, just for a second, to look at more broadly what are the, uh, the storage challenges out there. You can see here the top, what is it, six that are listed, top storage challenges. Now, the smart ones amongst you will have noticed, well, hang on, storage system costs, you just said that was really important, and it's now number two. That's because this is looking at things slightly differently. The, the preceding slide and my comments about economics are from the business perspective. It was business initiatives. These are simple challenges related to storage. So guess what? It's growth and storage and cost that are at the top. So in terms of the challenges that people have to deal with, probably no surprise what you see on the screen. I won't read them through to you. They're all things that you would recognize. But what this next chart does is to turn red, any, it's the same chart, but just with red writing rather than black writing, for all those areas that tape can actually do something to help, to, to mitigate, to manage, to improve. And, you know, honestly, it can help all these things. We could probably have an entire webinar on each of the areas and how it does it. But clearly, tape has their enormous direct value on those things which end users tell us are their most important challenges when it comes to the storage world. And it's hard to think of any other single technology that could cover so much in terms of those challenges. Now, I want to turn to something else that I've sort of touched on a little bit, but just to, to cover. Plus, it's a great excuse to put something up that isn't just five bullets or a, a research chart. But the elephant in the room, if you like, I, I've touched on it a couple of times. The idea that tape is disappearing as a backup tool 
or backup is be, is being pressed under the need for ever increasing growth and particularly speed. And this is a partial truth, as I've said. Some people are going to disk initially for their backup um, and then off to tape. But again, rather than just throw thoughts at you, I thought I would put the research up. And what this shows, as it says at the top, is the percentage of a total organization's backup data that is stored on various types of media. Now, you can see as you move from 2010, that's the left-hand column, to 2012, the right-hand column, that in terms of what people have and what they expect to have by next year, there is indeed some change. But you'll, you'll notice that nothing is moving as dramatically as you might have perceived or expected before we started this discussion. Now, the on-site tape admittedly has dropped as 4% of the total, and I don't want to whitewash this. You can see that in terms of using percentages, it's, it's dropped as 4% of the total from 17 to 13. That's actually about like a 25% drop in terms of usage, so it's not insignificant. In terms of off-site tape, it's 2% of the total, which is probably what my math isn't that great, but it's probably a 17 or 18% total change just in that component. But the other interesting thing here, and I, I really don't have the further research, it begs a question, but you'll notice that the third party, off-site third party service provider storage, which is at the very top, has grown dramatically by two thirds over the same time. And I'd be willing to put money that any smart third party off-site provider is probably using tape, almost definitely because that's how they make money and that's how they can keep their profit margins up. So all told, you've got a 4% drop on-site, 2% off-site for tape, but a 4% up on the third party aspect. And I'm sure a lot of that would be tape. So net net, my feeling, yeah, tape has probably dropped a little bit in this perspective. Of course, none of this takes account of the general growth in the overall market. This is a percentage, not the size of the market. But the change is not perhaps as dramatic as people might expect. You will remember I talked a couple of minutes ago about the use of tape as a trendy, relevant, sexy tool. So the last thing I want to cover before I get back to the outcome of the study is to look at, uh, as it says at the top, tape and the cloud. I mean, surely crusty old tape can't be important or used in the cloud. But if you watch the news earlier this year, there was a what well, I think a very significant announcement from Google, and they actually went public. They had a problem, guess what, disk-based, and the only way they could recover the 40,000 affected mailboxes was to go get them from tape, because those were clean, there was no corruption there. And what was most interesting, I think, we should all look at each other and smile or pat each other on the back if we're on the vendor side of this call, but you know, Google actually came out and said so. The maven of the, of the web 2.0 modern search world was out there saying tape had saved their bacon. So that was kind of interesting. Now, the next thing, getting away from just the story, is that at the end of the day, cloud, I don't, you know, internal, external, hybrid, don't really care. It's just IT that is consumed differently. Again, we could have a big philosophical debate, but at the end of the day, there's still IT systems underneath it. And, and, and so wherever it is owned or positioned and however it is consumed, it's still physical IT at the end of the day. And therefore, tape is at least as relevant there, wherever there is, as it is today in current data centers. The only thing I would say here and what I mean, if it's a third party cloud provider, that's what I mean by replace TCO with ROI. Because those people are not looking at how much they spend and therefore the total cost of ownership as much as they're looking on the return on their investment. And as I said a slide or so ago, making more money because as long as they can sell you a service level agreement and if they can get their costs down by you know, moving to tape and, and using clever archiving tools to still provide the service that you expect, then they can drive up their revenues and their margins rather than just their costs. So tape, as it says there, can be a perfect fit in the cloud. I'm not gonna go through all these, but uh, you know, the OPEX and CAPEX side, you can actually make arguments and they're at the bottom of the screen here. I wanna get back to the model. You can make arguments about taping better than disk. And it, it certainly is in certain ways as shown on the screen there. Okay, probably kept you waiting long enough, but I think this background information is very important to understand where tape fits in today's world. And as it says on the screen now, I want to go look at the TCO model in more detail, at least sufficient detail that I hope it will motivate you to look at the paper in total. The purpose of the study if you remember what I said up front, opinion's great, but facts really matter. And the purpose of the study was rather than just sit back and say, yeah, I think tape's still a bit cheaper, or maybe the dedupe stuff's taken over, was to actually work it out. Sit down, big Excel spreadsheet, and, and make it 
work it out on logical assumptions. In terms of the approach that we have taken, the model is fully open. I don't mean that the Excel spreadsheet is actually in the, uh, the white paper, well, because you couldn't use it, it wouldn't be interactive anyway. But what I do mean is that we haven't hidden anything behind the curtain. If you take a look at the white paper, all the assumptions, all the comments, all the ways we analyze things are very clearly listed there. Nothing's hidden. There are no assumptions that we made that aren't shown and open. There's about 30 assumptions and comments, and that may start making it sound complex. It's not. It's just detail. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples of what's there later on. In terms of a few comments, yes, we used LTO5 technology here. So obviously we're thankful to the LTO program for allowing the study to occur. But the major principles would apply to many sorts of tape in general, and that's just a, a fair comment. I've talked a lot about the rise of deduplication, but I want to make one other comment before I get to the numbers. You know, dedupe is it's a good thing. All the people behind the LTO program or consortium elsewhere in their organizations have dedupe offerings. There's nothing wrong with dedupe. The point is, how does it stack up economically? The other thing that I think will change, by the way, over time, it's beginning to happen a little already, is that dedupe will move more into the primary storage and it will be deduped, data will be deduped before it ever gets stored, which if you think about it, is far more logical than deduping on the back end and far better for the economics that I keep saying are so vital. That's great. That's better for storage per se. But with all the growth of data and applications, there still leaves a huge requirement for a massive data store on the back end. And if you've deduped data up front and now efficiently run it through solid state and maybe a few very fast disks, where better to put that massive data store than the most economic place, which is tape? You're probably bored with me telling the same story. The 18 terabytes we backed up, I just picked a couple of facts here. This is because we started with the assumption of a 35 terabyte system allocated at 52%, which is kind of a pretty good norm for what's out there, certainly in the mid and enterprise markets. We chose 30% off list price as a good guide. And as with everything else, you know, if you're lucky enough to be getting more than that, then it's fairly easy to plug it in. You'll be able to see which cell on the model that would affect. And you, know, you can take a very good swag and that's perfectly adequate, I think, in most cases, a very good swag of how this would actually apply to your situation. The link to the paper is there, and obviously I hope that many of you will be interested enough to go and take a look. In terms of the scenarios that we chose to investigate, so these are not actually the scenarios. These are the research that led to the scenarios. In other words, this tells you what people are actually doing today, whether they're going disk to tape, disk to disk, those are the first ones at the top, or disk to tape to tape, or disk to disk to tape. Everyone has different ways of doing things. These are the main alternatives that people might use. When you see our scenarios on the next page, scenario number one equates to the top line of this chart. And then whilst we don't really do much in terms of those at the bottom, we do cover the second and third major real ways of doing things in terms of what we cover. That will become clear as I go through this. And Dick Cosby will take you through his, and he falls very much into, if you like, the, the majority approach, disk to disk to tape, and you'll see that when he talks in just a second. So these were the scenarios, pure on-site backup, as I mentioned. We used a 15 to 1 dedupe ratio, and we used that throughout. Probably a little generous, but that's what we chose. A little generous in favor of disk, I should say. And compared to the LTO 5 tape library. And then you can see there, the three different approaches we took to adding in some form of DR capability, whether it was straight off to having one remote VTL, so replicated VTLs, or if we then had the same replicated VTLs, but we now move tape off-site by truck, or maybe now we replicated one of the VTLs by the WAN and compared that to moving off-site, tapes off-site by truck. So those are the things we looked at. and. This is the outcome for the first scenario. Now, don't panic. I am not going to uh, go through this depth of information on every scenario. I merely wanted to put one of these up to make the point that the detail is there, and that's why it's very easy for you to manipulate the model and take a look at what you want to do. Again, they're hardly cool graphics. What you're interested in is the outcome of all this and what did it mean. So for that first straightforward on-site backup, let's just look at the red because the gray just reaffirms what the scenario was. But the TCO with deduplication is 246% of the TCO of the LTO5 tape library in year one. Again, you can look at things in different ways. Obviously, over time, extra equipment is needed. So if you look through the whole five years, the TCO of the VTL option 
is still nearly, what, 178% of the Tate Library option. You can look at those in different ways, and this is what I said, different people like different approaches. The LTO5 option costs only 40% of the VTL option in year one, and it costs only 56% of the VTL option over five years. So, you know, look at, if you really wanted to really cut to the chase, it's half the cost. Very easy way to look at it for doing stuff on site. And then we have a lot more information on the other scenarios. No one is going to take it in if I talk through this uh, even fast. Um, you'll be able to see these charts later on. But you can see overall that the range of costs, depending what we do in terms of the remote VTLs and adding in the, the first off the truck and then the WAN and the truck, you're saving probably anywhere from 25 to 75% of the money by doing it with the tape offering rather than, or the tape library offering, I should say, an LTO5, rather than using deduped VTL. So anywhere from sort of, um, actually it's probably better than 25, it's probably in the region of 50 to 75% of your dollars can be saved by using the LTO approach. So the report also gives you some other views. This is one that's in there, and this is the one where I say you can look accurately at individual cells if you say, hey, I think Mark's ESG study is, you know, completely wrong in this area. I'd like to, you know, my off-site trucking doesn't cost whatever it is, four or 450 a month. You can go and look at the detail and make your own decision about what you'd like to put in that cell. It's very easy to work it out. Some reminders before I turn things over to uh, Dick in just a second. I was going to read some of the uh, appendix out, but I think for the sake of time, I'll skip that. All the assumptions, as I said, are in the appendix. You can look at absolutely everything there from how we did, how we assumed backup was done, which is nightly in this case, allocation levels, cost per square foot, power costs, when we had to add equipment on both types of the model, how much we put in for a storage administrator's salary, burden costs, and so on and so forth. It's not complex, it's just detailed, and that was what we wanted to get across. I've talked a lot about some of these other factors, economics being crucial, and, you know, neither I nor um, the, the LTO program are blind to, I mean, tape is not a panacea for everything. Of course, we get that, but um, maybe a mix of technologies is the, is the optimum answer. But in order to take us through a little bit more depth from an actual user, I'm very happy now to hand over the, the reins to Dix Cosby of Estes Express. Uh, you will spot a slight change in the accent, and he's going to take you through the situation that he has and his use of LTO. I'm Dick Cosby. I'm the system administrator for Estes Express. And as you heard earlier, I have lived through a disaster. Let me take you through the challenges that we face prior to facing the disaster so you'll get an idea of why we did what we did. Our challenges as some background, we had what we thought prior to this, uh, we thought was a very good approach to uh, backing up our data. But we found out over time that it really just didn't work. We were using a software replication product, and it was more than challenging. Like I said, it just did not work. So uh, we faced this, challenges to eliminate a nightly backup window, and of course that's independent of data volume increases, Eliminate the interruptions to production server jobs. In other words, we needed to run 24 by 7. We wanted to eliminate the complexity of having night operators uh, running backups. And as I said earlier, the complex data replication issues that we face. And, of course, to satisfy a daily point-in-time backup for a true recovery point. And to provide a cost-effective, fast, secure, reliable protection for long-term storage. And clearly, what I've indicated here has to do with costs. In other words, reduce costs. But in addition, and more importantly than just reducing costs, I wanted to be sure that we had the best data protection that we could come up with. I really think that we did. Now, as I said earlier, I'm going to cover a uh, disaster that we actually went through. And then we the next step will be to get into the details of how our solution is put together. Hopefully, none of you have had to suffer through this, but we did. As I've heard from other people that have gone through disasters, it's never what you expect, like so here. I thought we'd planned for everything, but as it turned out, we didn't think that our data center would ever be flooded. 
building's been here since 1948. It's never had any issues of flood until this hurricane. So here are some of the details. Hurricane Gaston hit us August 30th, 2004. 14 inches of rain in eight hours. Ground floor data center was flooded with four and a half feet of water for more than 12 hours. We had a total loss of all hardware, our networks, phone systems, even a generator outside, and the utility power to the building was gone. The utility power was uh, restored about three to four weeks later. So uh, we had a true disaster. So I'm going to stop for a minute and just kind of tell you what was going on. We knew the hurricane was in town. You couldn't miss it. We didn't know how bad it would be. Well, it stalled, and the downtown area was totally flooded. They had more like 12 to 15 feet of water. But our data center, which I said was directly under the the center of the storm, got the brunt of it. The stand there with water starting to come into the building and seeing this hardware, and it was this new hardware. We'd only implemented the solution a few months earlier. Seeing it just go deeper and deeper levels of water was just hard to conceive. The flood really started bad at about uh, 1,700, 5 o'clock that day. And by 6 o'clock, it was all over. The building was without lights, and uh, we had to evacuate the the ground floor. So from that point, we had to recover. And the recovery process was to order new hardware, which we did very quickly, but we didn't have any place to put it because the ground floor where the data center was located was completely gone. So we had to build a new data center up in our auditorium on the first floor. We didn't have power, so we had to bring in uh, generators, park them on the street, and we built a uh, UPS facility in one of our uh, trucks. It was August, so it was hot, so we had to put air conditioners, uh, portable air conditioners, outside the building with 24-inch diameter tubes going into the windows and, uh, you know, make do with, with what we could come up with. So with that in place, the hardware started showing up. We hooked it up, brought it up, and got it running. And as it turned out, uh, we were able to turn the business back over to our users in uh, a day to the hour. Well, what allowed us to do that? One thing, and one thing only, allowed us to recover. That was the fact that we had off-site tape storage. Without that, goodness only knows where we'd be today. So I'm going to cover it in a little bit more detail. So, and again, I ask, is there any good news here? Yes. We had a point-in-time tape backup of 100% of our data, which was off-site made the night before. Couldn't have been better for us. And what this turned out was uh, we have implemented a robust backup and archive process that provides fast access to our data and an effective archive system. We have multiple levels of protection. Tier 1, of course, is our line of business production data. Tier 2 is the uh, disk-to-disk backup. And Tier 3, of course, is our LTO backups that we have off-site. And it's very cost-effective. We've looked at options, and we keep coming back to this is by far the most productive way of doing this. So the backup process is run this way, disk-to-disk to tape. So each night we make a point-in-time data copy. This is handled by the SAN storage. That copy is then made available to our backup server, and part of this process requirement was do not interrupt any production jobs or or servers or individuals. We are 24 by 7 by 365, and uh, any kind of an outage is very costly to us. Once that is in place, we take the next step, which is to back it up to our LTO tapes. So with this in place, we have no production interruption, no save windows. Uh, And our virtualized tape library allows us to back up multiple servers without having dedicated tape drives. And, of course, there's no operator, so this is very much a lights-out operation. And when I say no save windows, what's great about this, we have until the next cycle begins to complete our backup. Whatever reason uh, there's a delay, it doesn't matter. We can save the tape all day long because we're not impacting our production jobs. When a company has to run 24 by 7, this is extremely important. So 
benefits and summary. I want to cover this in a little bit more detail. The use of LTO tape certainly reduces cost. And we have two processes here, this to this to tape for a uh, lot of business that's uh, 24 by 7. But then on the non-24 by 7, we have this to tape which makes much better sense for that process. So the disc to disc to tape eliminates production interruption. It's fast access to disc when we have to recover something from the previous day. And we have journaling so uh, we can recover basically to the transaction by that method. Since we're controlled by the Department of Transportation, we have some very long-term tape requirements, and we do that very effectively and very cost effectively. And that gives us multiple layers of protection. Uh, the disk to tape, it's a very low cost archive solution. The process eliminates night operators again. Uh, this is all done with scheduled jobs. And one thing I'll point out, there's no maintenance cost for an LTO tape cartridge. Uh, that goes where it's saying, but uh, a lot of times you don't think about that. We consider that with a uh, disk to disk uh, solution. Uh, and there is cost with all of that. And for us, the LTO5 media cost per terabyte is about $20. And, of course, it uses no power. So uh, cost per terabyte is very, very low. And it's, it goes without saying LTO and most tape uh, library reliability is exceptional. And it's very easy to use. And a plus also here is the LTO data encryption. It's built into the product. So with that said, I'll summarize very quickly by saying, how do we control costs and how do we protect our data? I think we have come up with a solution that works very well. But the bottom line here is we had to do something to protect our data. We can replace hardware all day long, but if your data is gone, the business may also be gone too. So with that, I'm turning it back over to you, Mark. Thank you, Dick. Thank you very much. Interesting and insightful, and I know that real people who actually run data centers always like to hear from real people who actually run data centers. There's a reminder here um, of where you can pick up the white paper. Very easy address to remember, ultrium.com slash white paper. Here, uh, for the sake of time and to leave even just you know one or two minutes for questions, um, this was just to talk about there's a lot of data out there, and tape is the only thing, in my view, that looks to have the ability to deal with the huge volumes of data that we're always going to have. My closing slide, I'm not going to go through all this, but um, so I'm going to have to skip my exciting talk about mirror conversations, but people do not think about you know tape substrates or you know necessarily IOs. Real users think about improving their results, dealing with their economic challenges, dealing with the massive growth of data. And I'd like to see the tape industry as a whole, you know, almost be, Dick, as, as you probably heard, sounds proud of what he's got, justifiably so. And I think that the tape industry needs to be more assertive, certainly less apologetic, and, and not say, hey, why not tape? But, you know, why, why, why are you putting it on disc in the first place? I think uh, I will cover my glorious pun here, but, you know, TAPE could stand for the answer for persistent economics, because I think uh, I, I went on and on about economics, but that's exactly where tape can fit. And I covered some of the sub-bullets as we went through in, in terms of tape being a viable part of the, the new requirements for the storage world. TCO matters and LTO technology can deliver. INSIC and LTO, those are two industry organizations, both dealing with specifying the parameters and capabilities of tape going forward. And I will tell you, I mean, obviously, LTO has put out uh, general specifications up to Generation 8. I think Generation 6 is uh, the next firmed up one right now. The INSIC looks at uh, the tape industry broadly and, you know, is looking 10 years out and 100 terabytes plus per cartridge. There is plenty of room left in the tape industry for growth to deal with all the needs that any of you might have. And as the final point says, you know, strategic blends of, of disc and tape are ultimately important but tape clearly has a role. With that, I'll hand it back to uh, Kimberly. Well, thank you, uh, Mark and Dick, for sharing your findings and your insights with us. We have received a few questions from the field. I'm just going to start with one question for Dick, and then I'll have one more question for both Mark and Dick to answer. Dick, someone wants to know, how much data do you store on tape, uh, and how much data do you store on disk? That's a good question. We, uh, I just went through this analysis, as a matter of fact. We currently have about two and a half terabytes of, uh, of tape storage and about 75, uh, excuse me, 
two and a half petabytes of tape storage and 75 uh, terabytes of, of disk storage. Uh, thank you. So um, we have time for one more question, and this was directed to both of you for your opinions. Um, is tape technology keeping up with the growth of data? Mark, do you want to take that one first? I think the answer is, as well as anything else, there's nothing else out there. That the magic, I, I covered some of this, the magic is to reduce the data that you store in the first place. That's why things like, you know, if you take a more broad look at this, thin provisioning, deduplication, complete, certainly primary dedupe and compression all have their role to play. But however you deal with that, no one can imagine a world where we don't have a massive amount of long-term storage that is required. And much of it is stored just, quote, in case. Uh, some of it is active archives, some of it is for backup and DR purposes, and all those are less frequent access, don't demand something that, you know, as, as Dick was talking about, don't demand something that sits there and spins, and tape is the place for that, and because of what I told you about both INSIC and LCO, in, in LTO rather, in terms of forming where the industry goes, I see every reason that the growth in technology and tape can keep us up with that growth in data, yes. Okay, this is Dick again. I'd like to add uh, uh, my opinion of that. We're using LTO5 for a number of reasons. One is because, yes, it does back up faster than the LTO4s or 3s. But the other thing uh, that we consider is how fast does it restore? You know, the newer technologies certainly uh, runs faster in both directions. Uh, and as far as does tape keep up, absolutely. The LTO5 is growing faster than that data. And if we ever get to the point that uh, it can't keep up in a 24-hour cycle, it's really simple. With this approach, we can just add a second or third uh, tape drive to the backup process. So uh, uh, with a very cost-effective uh, mechanism that's unquestionably the most reliable backup uh, that we've ever seen, LTO is certainly keeping up. That's great. Thank you. Um, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and thank you to our, to our speakers. If you have any questions that were not addressed here, you can feel free to visit the Ultrium website, which is ultrium.com, or on the screen right now, there is an email for me, Kimberly Sturdivant. You can shoot me an email. You can also access the white paper titled 2011, A Comparative TCO Study, VTLs, and Physical Tape by clicking on the news section on the ultrium.com website. Thanks again to our speakers, Mark Peters and Dick Cosby, and thanks to all of you for joining our webinar today. Goodbye.